When Akhenaton overthrew the Egyptian gods and demons, making the cult of the one god Aton a state religion, he also suppressed mortuary magic. The reformer king did not believe in a life beyond the grave. Yet it was upon the afterlife that Egyptian magic centered. In the course of the ages, this magic had become an elaborate science whose aim was to win for the dead a pleasant life in the hereafter. The massive pyramids and tombs built for the deceased pharaohs and their ministers, for priests and other dignitaries, suggests the power that the dead wielded over all minds. Looking at these monuments, we can sense the impossible task that Akhenaton faced when he sought to banish mortuary magic from the Egyptian religion. In the West, the Egyptians believed, lies the world of the dead, where the sun god disappears every evening. They spoke of the departed as Westerners. The belief in a world of the dead often mingled with the notion of an underworld. It is through this subterranean world that the ship of the sun sails during the night. The dead await it impatiently and rejoice when its divine radiance appears. Then the dead souls, filled with delight, seize a rope from the ship and tow it through the depths. It was also believed that the dead, disguised as birds, soar into the sky where his heavenly barge Ra, the sun god, awaits them and transforms them into the stars to travel with him through the vault of the heavens. Or again, a lentil field lies high in the northeast, where the grain grows taller than it does on the banks of the Nile, and where the dead live on in peace and abundance. However, this blessed land is waterlocked, and none but just the just and righteous may persuade the obdurate ferrymen to row them across. The cult of the dead reached a peak when it incorporated the Osiris myth. Osiris, divine brother and husband of Isis, was born to save mankind. At his nativity, a voice was heard proclaiming that the Lord had come into the world. But the diabolical, vengeful Seth shut him up in a chest which he conveyed to the sea by the Tanaitic mouth of the Nile. Isis wandered in search of the body, and at last, near the city of Byblos in Syria, she found the coffin in a tamarisk tree which had grown up around it. She carried it back to Egypt, but now Seth dismembered the body and scattered its parts far and wide. A second time the grieving Isis set out upon her arduous search for her husband's scattered limbs. She interred the fragments wherever she found them, or, as others believed, buried an image in all these spots, pretending that it was the body, to the end that Osiris might be honored in many places. According to this version, she fastened the limbs together with the help of the god Nephthys, Thoth, and Horus, her son. She fanned the body with her wings, and through her magic art Osiris rose again to reign henceforth as king over the dead. There he was assisted by the forty-two helpers, hideous representatives of the sins, with Osiris exercising power over the souls of the departed. Before this tribunal, in the hall of both truths, appear the dead, to have their hearts weighed in the scales of righteousness. According to the verdict, they receive everlasting life or are punished for their sins. Those whom Osiris brings to reckoning are condemned to hunger and thirst, to lie in the dark and solitary grave from which they may never return to sunlight, or they are tossed to abominable executioners in the shape of crocodiles and hippopotami, eager to tear them asunder. The good and the righteous, however, now receive their reward. In the course of ages, these diverse traditions concerning the blessed and their afterlife have tended to mingle. According to belief, the dead will live on in the fields of Yaru or soar to Ra, the sun god, or they will descend to Osiris in the underworld, or again to Abydos, the city of the dead, whose sovereigns were once the living rulers of Egypt. Whereas the soul, known as Ba, passes into the afterlife, the Ka remains with the mummy. The Ka is a mysterious life force, a tenuous counterpart of the soul, which continues to live a magical reflection of life in the grave, among the tomb possessions of the deceased or among the pictures of such objects. Images, statuettes, imitation utensils, miniature houses take the place of real things. Magical operations give them their efficacy, and the small-scale replicas of reality attract the Ka, since the Ka is unable to detect the difference between them and reality. Or rather, through the magical operations of mortuary priests, the replicas become reality. 
The priest could thus assure the Ka of the deceased the serene life in the silent depths of the grave, from which it might at this at times emerge to be gladdened by the sun. But what advantage did these promises gain if the Osiris tribunal condemned the Ba soul? Here, too, priestly magic offered a solution. The Egyptian gods could be deceived, menaced, and forced into obedience. So implicitly did the Egyptians trust the power of magic, the virtue of the spoken world, the irresistibility of magic gestures and other rituals, that they hoped to bend even the good gods to their will. The priests would bring dreadful retribution to the deities who failed to deal leniently with the dead. They threatened to shoot lightning into the arm of Shu, god of the air, who would then no longer be able to support the sky goddess, and her star-sown body would collapse, disrupting the order of all things. The priests filled papyrus scrolls with magical formulas enabling the deceased to withstand the judges of the world beyond. The Book of the Dead told precisely what the soul would encounter during its journey into the shadowy kingdom, and how the deceased might plead his cause. This scroll revealed the secret names of the demons and inquisitor gods. Knowledge of the spirit's true name gave to the deceased power over the spirit. The answers to the examiner's questions were transcribed word for word, and knowing them was sufficient to obtain a favorable verdict. I have always shunned evil. I have given bread to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, a ship to the stranded. To the orphan I was a father, to the widow a husband, to the roofless I gave a home. These answers, uttered with the correct intonation and the, in, the, in the prescribed phraseology, would pass for truth. But what if the deceased should find himself unable to pronounce the words? What if the spirits of the air robbed him of breath, or other evil spirits stole his mouth, his head, his heart, or even his name, without which he lost all identity? For this emergency, too, the Book of the Dead contains formulas and incantations. A guidebook placed in the sarcophagus or inscribed on it conducts the wayfarer into the next life. Despite these arts, one fear remained. In the tribunal hall, before the terrifying judges, might not the conscience of the traveler rebel within him and cause his heart to rise against the deceitful words issuing from his mouth? Here, too, priestly magic pro provided assistance. On the mummy's breast, the sacred beetle, a scarab, was fastened, with a charm to pacify the restive heart. O oh, my heart, rise not as a witness against me.